I've been recently wondering whether or not I should wear a tie at work and I'd like to explain the background to this. So I'm an economics professor and ordinarily I'd probably wear a shirt and maybe a jacket sometimes and I like to dress quite casually but I recognise that when I'm teaching and if I'm in front of an audience then it's not the normal thing to be so casual. Normal thing is to look a bit smarter, dress a bit smarter and to really send a signal to your audience and we do this by typically wearing a tie, maybe a suit and tie as well. And the reason we use this signal is because we want to convey information that may otherwise be hard to detect. So the signal that I'm trying to send, and I think most people in business settings try to send, are certain attributes such as maybe intelligence, competency, the fact that you're organised, maybe even that you're sophisticated. You have to be somewhat sophisticated to tie a tie. And so wearing a tie is a signal that you have those attributes. However, wearing a tie is quite easy to imitate. So it isn't really a good signal. Lots of people who aren't intelligent, competent, organized and sophisticated are quite capable and they often do wear ties. And also, am I so insecure about my own attributes that I feel like I need to use these signals? Now interestingly, as an academic, I have another opportunity open for me, which is instead of really thinking about the signal that I'm sending, is to recognise that I can also send a counter signal. Now a counter signal is when somebody is such high status that they don't even need to signal it. And I'll run through some interesting examples of this. For example, we can think about dating. The baseline case is somebody who's undateable. Now this is from the Channel 4 series, Undatables, and I don't want to cast aspersions about this person, I don't know who he is. I'm just using him as an example of somebody who's undateable. And the problem with people like this is that they might be rude and a bit obnoxious, they may be demanding, they're not very sensitive, and typically women don't find this um, very appealing for them. So what most men try and do is they try and engage in some signalling behaviour. Um, a normally sophisticated person, when they're trying to date somebody, will attempt to distinguish themselves from those losers and they will distinguish themselves by doing various deeds. Maybe they will give some flowers, maybe they'll offer some compliments, perhaps they'll show some consideration. But there's also another strategy available. There's another group of people involved here and this is the counter signalers. Uh, counter signalers are high status people who are so high status that they're not too concerned about being thought of as losers. In fact, what they want to do is to distinguish themselves from the average people. Now, the way that they distinguish themselves from the average people is to not be too keen, is to engage in a lack of subtlety, perhaps, and maybe even run the risk of offending the person that they're talking to. Now, in Scott Alexander's terms, I think he uses the term signalling to mean contrarian and the counter-signaller is meta-contrarian. And I think a lot of the uh, analysis that I'm doing here um, fits in to that framework. Another example that we can look at is in terms of wealth. So the baseline case is people that don't have wealth. So we might have some low-income people. And this is, again, a stock photo of me trying to find people that look like typical uh, low-income now, if you're not low income and you don't want to be um, thought of as low income, you may well engage in some kind of signaling behavior. Middle income people will attempt to signal their wealth. They want to distinguish themselves from the poor people. And the way they may do this is things like their accessories, hats, gloves, handbags, their clothing, their manners, their habits and customs, the fact they drive a nice car, all of these are reasonably effective signals that they're not low income people. But then who are the counter signalers? Well, they're going to be the people who are so wealthy, they don't feel the need to prove to anybody that they're not low income. We can think of aristocrats. This is a picture of Lord Bath. And clearly he's not worried about people thinking that he's not wealthy. 
the aim of the aristocrat or the high wealth people is that they want to distinguish themselves from the middle income people. And so the way they may do this is by wearing cheap clothes and perhaps having a lack of manners or engaging in eccentric behavior. Again, they don't have any fears that they'll be um, thought of as being low income. Their only fear is that they'll be thought of as middle income. The last example I'll use is intelligence. Now the baseline case here is just to be a normal person and I'm speaking as an academic where most academics think that normal people are low expertise and something like this image here. And obviously as you become an academic you want to engage in certain signaling behaviour to distinguish yourselves from the general public and the people who walk around looking like this. So what are some of the signals that medium expertise people take? Um, this example that I'm using is somebody that uses their title in their Twitter feed. Um, not only that, but also complain that an airline um, doesn't refer to them using their title. So these moderate expertise people, their main aim is to distinguish themselves from the non-academics. And the way they do that is by using their title, um, perhaps always talking about their research and reminding everybody that they're very clever because they work for a university. Now the counter signalers here are the people that are high expertise and such high expertise that they know that there's no real danger that people will think they're stupid and what they really want to do is separate themselves from the moderate expertise people. In this case the counter signal counter signalers are high expertise people and I'm going to use the example of um, Dame Mary Douglas. I knew Mary Douglas personally before she passed away and she was one of the most down-to-earth and humble people you'd probably ever meet. If we went out for lunch then nobody um, that we would encounter whilst we went out for lunch um, would think that she was one of at the time greatest um, living um, British public intellectuals. Um, now I want to make it clear that Mary Douglas never said anything mean at all about moderate expertise people uh, but in her character and her mannerisms it was clear that she didn't feel any necess necessity um, to signal her status. Um, high expertise people want to distinguish themselves from moderate expertise um, and the way that they do that is via a lack of titles and by shunning some of the systems that the moderate expertise undertake. Now the reason why this can be quite interesting is because the high expertise people can increasingly begin to resemble the low expertise people. Mary Douglas is booking an airplane ticket and isn't using her title and isn't insisting on people referring to her by her title and isn't reminding everybody about the wonderful books that she wrote and the amount of research that she inspired. And people may mistake her for being somebody that didn't make incredible contributions to knowledge. Now interestingly, being an academic, you often encounter academics and certainly the higher up you go, the more down to earth people tend to become the less concerned they are at the signals they're sending out. And in fact, in many cases, they become to increasingly look like and appear to be low expertise people. A good example of this is how if you take even elite professors in American universities, many of them are engaged in such effective counter signaling, they can become almost indistinguishable from very low expertise status groups. In fact, there's a famous website which is called prof.orhobo.com, where you have to look at photos of various people and try and guess whether they are a famous, successful academic professor or whether, in fact, they're a hobo. So it can become very hard to distinguish low, high, low status and high status, um, and the distinction can be a subtle one. So this is a picture where I would be somebody that would struggle to guess whether this is a high status or low status person. It's not clear to me whether this is a um, potentially a homeless person, could potentially be um, a scally, could be a chav. Um, these are kind of usually derogatory terms made used to refer to people on low incomes. But then this also could be somebody engaged in very high fashion, and this could be somebody that's seen at the cutting edge um, of what's trendy at any moment in time. Because I'm obviously in not nowhere near the same elite group it's very difficult for me to tell, and I guess that is the point. Now, I think work culture 
is changing to reflect these points and this balancing act between signalling and counter-signalling that people are engaged in. A nice example of this is Terry Richardson, who always dresses in a very similar style. It's a style that you might think is a kind of lumberjack or moderately successful American hillbilly that lives in a trailer park. But in fact, he's an incredibly successful fashion photographer and he's wearing this dress coat um, because he knows that he can. Uh, perhaps the most famous example is Steve Jobs. Um, this is just a picture showing how Steve Jobs' choice of clothing changed from the late 1990s to when he passed away in 2011. He famously wore the same uh, uniform. Um, and another example of this is Mark Zuckerberg. So this is Mark Zuckerberg wearing his famous um, grey t-shirt and blue jeans. Now, Zuckerberg himself um, has said that the reason why he wears the same clothes is because of decision fatigue. He says that he wants to free up his mental space for more important things uh, rather than having to decide what he's going to wear in the morning. But I don't think this is necessarily true because Barack Obama um, also engaged in adopting a personal uniform. And Barack Obama also says that he doesn't want to have to decide what he's going to wear every morning. And yet he chose for his personal uniform to be a suit and tie. There's something interesting about the fact that Zuckerberg chose to wear a t-shirt and jeans as his uniform and there clearly is some signalling taking place. Perhaps the signal is that he doesn't care about fashion, perhaps he's signalling the fact that he doesn't have a boss, he's signalling the fact that he doesn't have to adhere to old-fashioned work norms. Where this is leading is I think a point that Tyler Cowen made, um, which is that these increasingly subtle distinctions favour in-groups and therefore may hinder social mobility. It used to be quite easy for somebody to move to a different country maybe, perhaps even to an environment like Silicon Valley, and understand what the norms were in terms of what you should wear to work. These days it becomes increasingly difficult to ascertain what the norms are and you have to have increasingly sophisticated knowledge about what people are wearing and what signals people are sending to be able to interpret what's appropriate in any given circumstance. For me personally, I'm somewhat uneasy about high status groups denigrating aspiration. So when it's a sincere form of counter signaling, there's something admirable, something enjoyable about this. But when we start to see high status people engaged in deliberate counter signaling as a distinct effort to try and prevent people from moving up hierarchies, then it leaves somewhat sad taste in my mouth. Now, I never know whether or not this is a fact of getting older and becoming perhaps increasingly conservative to think about these hierarchies, but the person that taught me the most about the importance of social hierarchies is in fact Mary Douglas. So I think in conclusion, I'll probably keep wearing the tie.